Good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Ted Geyer. I am the Vice President and Director of Economic Studies here at Brookings. Uh, June 1st will mark the fifth anniversary of General Motors filing for bankruptcy, about one month after Chrysler did the same. And this led to the federal government acquiring a significant stake in both companies. At the end of last year, US Treasury, the US Treasury sold off its last shares of GM, with Treasury Lou declaring, this important chapter in our nation's history is now closed. With all government-held shares in GM and Chrysler now sold, taxpayers have booked almost a $12 billion loss. Today, Chrysler, now owned by Fiat, is profitable. GM has been doing well, at least until their recent spate of recalls, including, I think, one just yesterday. And of course, the controversy about their delaying the reporting of problems with a faulty ignition switch. But now, five years later on, it's an especially good time for us to evaluate the government rescue and to examine where the companies and the broader economy stand today. The collapse of these auto companies hit at a time when the broader economy was in the midst of the Great Recession. The main justification for the government intervention was that hundreds of thousands of jobs would have been lost at a time when we were bleeding jobs throughout the country. The government's management of the bankruptcy process at the time was highly controversial, especially concerning the terms offered to the secured bondholders compared to the terms offered to UAW. The question today, five years later on, is was it worth it? Were the government bailouts necessary to avoid a disorderly liquidation of the companies? And was the prevention of job and income losses worth the cost? Our first speaker today, Larry Summers, was at the heart of the decision-making process as the head of President, President Obama's National Economic Council. Uh, as Larry said recently in an interview with Harvard Business Review, quote, I always ask when I'm advocating a course of action or someone else is advocating a course of action to me, how will we know five, 10 years from now whether we were right? What would convince us that we had screwed up? So today's event is a way for him and for others to answer the question of whether the government's intervention was indeed right or whether it was, to use his technical term, screwed up. Um, of course, it's entirely possible for something to be both right and screwed up, uh, which I'll allow that as, as an option for our panelists today. After Larry speaks, we will have a panel on the implication, implications of the government's rescue of the companies and then another panel on the state of manufacturing and manufacturing policy in the US. We'll then close with an interview of Sergio Marchionne, CEO of, of Fiat and Chrysler. And with that, I am going to let uh, Larry and Alan Murray, our moderator, take it away. So please join me in welcoming our first panel. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Ted, for asking the first question. Uh, uh, but, but before we do that, I just want to take the, Ted took us back five years ago. I want to go back 10 years before that, when you were on the cover of Time Magazine, what was it, February 1999, as one of the three marketeers saving the global economy. Uh, and part of the recipe was privatization, telling people to, to get, out of, uh, get out of private business. So it was an irony 10 years later to find yourself sitting in the White House talking about a massive bailout of, of GM. So, so give us your five years on now, your accounting, cost benefits. How, how Just they actually, actually, in fairness, uh, a large part of the recipe in 1999 was the massive application of financial force to restore confidence. And that had been the centerpiece of the strategic response to the Asian financial crisis, which so at consistent. the time we judged to be successful. And the massive application of financial force to restore confidence was central to the strategy uh, in 2009. So I think, there's, I think there actually was uh, quite a bit of consistency around what I had called, uh, uh, starting in the 90s, the Powell Doctrine of Finance that if you were going to intervene, you need to intervene at substantial scale. How could we have known if we, what could be happening today that would lead me to think we had made a mistake? I think there are three things you could be seeing today that would lead me to think we'd made a mistake. Fortunately, none of them are things that we see. One is you could see that either GM or Chrysler had failed. And basically, we'd prop them up for another year and a half, 
and it hadn't really worked, and a reasonable judgment was that we had thrown good money after good money uh, after bad, and merely delayed a little bit an inevitable, painful uh, failure. That did not happen. Second thing that could have happened would have been that a reasonable reading of developments in uh, the credit markets and the ways in which loaning, you know, if somebody had produced a $27 billion dip financing in August of 2009, it would have been reasonable to suppose that we had had insufficient nerve and that if we had just left this to the conventional bankruptcy mechanism, that private finance would have been available on a substantial scale. I think nothing that happened in credit markets between 2009 and 2011 would suggest that our lack of confidence in what the private market could do um, would uh, have uh, been, uh, was, un was unwarranted. And the third thing that could have happened that would have constituted a failure today is uh, that uh, this could have been uh, Vietnam. The government could still be heavily involved uh, with the companies. It could turn out that a democratic administration was incapable of keeping hands off. And the process of government involvement through bankruptcy could have led to all kinds of new government mandated labor arrangements, all kinds of new government mandated <coughs> environmental arrangements, all kinds of barriers to necessary restructuring and shrinkage. And these things could be being, op the automobile companies could be being operated as public utilities uh, in some sense. Or I suppose a fourth thing that could happen would be that there were managers of big companies in America thinking that it was OK to take risks or be incompetent because the government would bail them out. And citing the example of the automobile companies as a basis for complacency. Well, that may any still, of, that could if, still happen. Well, but it, it, anything could happen in the future. But if you ask, are people looking, are there CEOs who think, and, you know, gee, it's OK. The worst that could happen is I'll be like Rick Wagner. I just don't see that, uh, particularly in the culture uh, right now. There's a lot of discussion. And if this were a different panel, it would be something we could come back to. There's a lot of discussion of the possibility that there are fixed income investors in banks who are relying on some kind of government put, implicit or explicit. I'm not aware, and I do make efforts to inquire periodically um, about government fi about fixed income investors in large private corporations, and you know I've asked, I've actually asked. You know, it's credit spreads have come way down, and I, I've asked a variety of people in the markets: Is it conceivable that that's because people think there are more bailouts than there used to be? And I have not heard that put forward as a hypothesis by anyone even people who opposed the bailouts. So I guess I think that by the test, which is what would have constituted failure, I, I could have given it. That's, I gave the answer I just gave is the answer that I gave myself at the time and sort of satisfied myself that the risks of each of those things were very low. And I think ex post, um, those judgments appear to have been uh, borne out. Let's just go back to, uh, to the first one. You said uh, uh, GM and Chrysler are still around. They haven't gone under. But are you happy with the state of the US uh, auto industry? I mean, do you, do you uh, did the bailout, uh, I mean, we're just, we're dealing with these. I think there are two questions. Yeah. There are two questions about the US auto industry. Uh, one question is, am I happy with total automobile sales in the United States? And I guess the answer is not hugely, because if you had told me that the US economy was only going to grow at 2% a year for six years, I would have thought that was disappointing. And I would have hoped for better. And I would attribute that failure to lack of aggressiveness in the, total, in the totality of 
policy response, and so that's got much more to do with errors of omission in terms of continued infrastructure spending, continued fiscal stimulus, and the like, than it does to errors of commission. So, metza metza on that. If you'd said, um, am I satisfied with the relative competitive position of General Motors and Chrysler, the two companies we intervened in, relative to the rest of the industry, yes, it's better than I would have expected in uh, the fall of 2009. Now, if you look at General Motors uh, stock price uh, since 2010, adjusted for market moves, you'd have to say that it's underperformed the market and that means that in some sense, relative to an expectation in 2010, you can't say that it's done that much better than expected. Although some of that's because it's a cyclical and the cycle has done worse uh, than uh, expected. But yeah, I think uh, I would say that relative to a sensible expectation, given the weakness of the US economy, and given that coming into this, there had been a massive legacy of mismanagement um, uh, throughout the automobile industry. Um, I would say given those things, if you had told me, um, if you told me in the fall, of, in, the, in May of 2009, this is how the economy is gonna be, we're going to avert a depression and all that, no better, no worse. Will you take it or will you take your chances with policy? I would have taken my chances with policy. So in that sense, for the economy as a whole, I'm disappointed. If you had told me the US GDP, US GDP is going to grow at an average of 2% a year, the employment ratio is barely going to increase, and this is where the US automobile industry is going to be after your restructuring and bankruptcy, I would have taken that in a heartbeat. So you suggested there's been no moral hazard, no discernible moral hazard cost in the uh, industrial sector um, uh, as, there, as there has been in the financial sector, and you made a reference to Rick Wagner being fired. Was that a critical piece of it, pushing out uh, Rick Wagner? Because the CEOs, for the most part, weren't pushed out by government in the financial sector. I'm going to stick with discussing the automobile, discussing the automobile industry. Look, I think you made the comparison. You, yeah, okay. You, uh, <laughs> let's let's start with let's start with uh, let's start with the automobile okay. uh, industry. We, we we may get to the, we may get to the uh, comparison. Look, I think the question of moral hazard in, involves a whole variety of things. First of all, central to thinking about the thing is the fact that we had an unprecedentedly low level of automobile sales um, while this was happening. So if we assume that a precedent has been set that the next time automobile sales are six standard deviations below anything that anybody forecasts, there will be a bailout. That doesn't hugely worry me because <laughs> nobody's gonna be much focused on that, number one. Number two, even with that, I think there was a lot of pain spread around. Anybody who's thinking about loaning money to an automobile company uh, knows that if things go wrong, they're going to take a big haircut. Maybe they're even going to take too big a haircut because, as some argue, the bankruptcy is going to be messed up to the detriment of the creditors. So I don't think you got any moral hazard on the lending side. Do you have moral hazard on uh, the manage on uh, the management side? It certainly looks like the management teams of these companies uh, experienced uh, very uh, experienced very substan very substantial pain. Does America, whatever problem America had through the '80s and '90s? Do you look at industrial America today and say debilitating union settlements caused by overly strong unions uh, facing management is 
creating excessively high wages, and that's a large and continuing problem. Now, it doesn't feel like that's a large and continuing problem in industrial America today. So I find it very difficult to find a place where uh, there is a moral hazard or where people are uh, thinking about uh, that kind of precedent. Now, are the, um, are, uh, what about uh, the, uh, the financial uh, s sector? Um, there, you uh, hyped what I said. I said there, there were arguments about moral hazard. I didn't, I, I, and people who felt that there was a legacy of moral hazard, I think you can study credit spreads to a variety of different conclusions. But it's a legitimate argument there, I think, unlike in the case of the automobile companies. I think there, there was a judgment, there were a set of judgments made. The most important judgments, most important judgment in my view, was the judgment made in the fall of 2008 when I was in civilian life to provide assistance to all the banks. A judgment was made to provide assistance to all nine of the largest financial institutions in the country. And the reason that judgment was made, and it was a judgment that you had to be in the room to evaluate, but I have no reason to, to quarrel with it, that judgment was made because the feeling was that if you separated out only a limited number of firms and supported them, you would create stigma for those firms relative to other firms, and that stigma would be debilitating. And once you'd made a decision that you had to have all the firms accept your assistance, there was a limit to how onerous the terms could be, because some of the firms didn't really need uh, the assistance, and so to get them to accept it, you had to make the thing, you had to make the service less assistance. And so bad so, behavior didn't get punished. So the, the judgment was that the need, the overarching need to maintain confidence made it necessary to punish bad behavior less than justice required. And that was the judgment that was made in 2008. And I think, the cent in my view, the center of that judgment was the judgment that it was necessary, again, I was, this was not when I was in the government, the, was the necessity of uh, avoiding partial, uh, avoiding distinguishing between institutions in terms of the kind of support that was required. And it would have been a very brave decision at that moment, and perhaps a foolishly brave uh, decision, to single out a small number of institutions uh, for, whereas the context in automobiles was, uh, was very different. Nobody argued that um, the government needed to design a program that Ford would accept as well as General Motors and Chrysler, because otherwise you'd be stigmatizing General Motors and Chrysler, which would lead to lack of confidence in them. That was not an argument yeah. that anybody made, and it would have seemed absurd, but it wasn't at all an absurd or implausible argument given the degrees of interconnection in finance. So back to, uh, uh, back to the auto bailout, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, anything you would have done differently? Look, uh, battlefield medicine's never perfect. The basic balance, the, we basically we struck a couple of balances. We struck a balance between um, being too soft and setting terrible precedents, not forcing necessary restructuring, and being too hard and killing what we were trying to uh, save. And I think we struck that balance broadly about right. Well, let me, let me ask we you. Also struck, uh, we also struck a balance in terms of the breadth of what we did. Were we gonna do the automobile companies? Were we gonna do suppliers? How broad a network of manufacturing were we uh, going to do? Do what's necessary. It's necessary not to do more than what's necessary. I think we struck that balance uh, broad, uh, broadly uh, right. Would we have been at the margin 
even more careful than we were about um, doing this as much like a private bankruptcy with as little special role for the government in terms of how corporate decisions uh, were made. We probably could have done uh, marginally, uh, marginally better on, uh, on, that, uh, on that score. There's a lot of debate about so the law reviews are filled uh, with uh, debate about whether we got wrong the relative degrees of pain imposed on uh, debt holders and imposed on uh, workers and unions. And there's a lot of argument uh, well, back, well, a lot of argument, a lot of argument back and back and forth. I guess I'd say, I guess what I would say um, is the uh, vast majority of the creditors did vote for the plan first. Second, um, I think it's important, Alan, uh, to, uh, to recognize that we had set a standard uh, that I sort of set in meetings with the team that this was to be done in a way that was within the envelope of private sector restructurings that were broadly similar that had taken place in the steel industry, particularly was the example I used. And there's room for arguing. It depends on sort of the de jure, de facto treatment of some categories of debt. You can argue um, both yeah, yeah, sides, yeah, your, both what, sides what's your, of that, what's your view? but you, broadly, I uh, did, did the unions I think get off got too a, easy? I, you know, I think that look, I, I think you can argue the unions no, as I'm part not, of the I'm deal. Not asking for an as part of the deal, as part of the deal, as part of the deal, Alan, the unions made a judgment <laughs> that um, they were going to protect in full the wages of more senior workers and move to a so-called blended system where the wages of the new workers who were coming in would be much, much lower. Was, would it have been more appealing to me to have had a system where there was more uniform wages? Yes, it would have been more appealing to me. Did I think it was the place of the government to decide what the negotiating position of the United Auto Workers should be? No, of course not. And so I respected their judgment representing their workers in the context of their uh, democratic, uh, democratic union. So yeah, would I titrate various things? Would every statement that every official in the administration made at every juncture be precisely the statement that I would make with hindsight? Of course not. But broadly, this was a balance between hard and soft, between wide and narrow, between the need for the government to be involved and the need to respect private, sec private sector, was that were those balances broadly struck in the right way? Yes, I would yeah, argue just today other, that they were. Just one other uh, question uh, on that balance b b before we leave it. I'm sure the issue of, of uh, the creditors and the unions is going to be rehashed throughout the uh, day today, so the people have plenty of chances to get on that. But the other one I want to ask you about, you talked about management pain. Well, the pain was Rick Wagner. He lost his job. But uh, some would argue that this was a company that had a quarter century history of, of bad management and, the, and, the, and Fritz Henderson uh, moves up. So it was not the government who brought in, out, really, who brought in outside management to, to uh, GM. That happened later. Was, was that in retrospect? Should you have been more aggressive on the management front uh, at the outset? Given what you now know, I don't. Th well, yes and uh, yes and no. Um, well, that's a I start. Did, okay, we got a little uh, movement there. I did, <laughs> here's the here's the here's the, here's the, pro here's, the here's the problem, and I, I guess um, I remember the analyses that um, Steve and Harry and I and others uh, spent uh, discussing all this uh, around my table at the time. Here's the problem: you can make a reasonable, you can make a quite reasonable and strong argument that the GM management team as a whole, going 
10 or 20 deep, uh, 10 or 20 people deep, or maybe even deeper, had really been a failure over a long time, uh, over a long time period. I, there have been some who have said, no, it was really all, they were actually doing fine and turning the company around, and it was all just that it was a 9 million car a year. I don't believe that. I think you can argue that the management had been quite fundamentally flawed for a long time. Here's the problem. Okay, so they've been flawed. So you can wake up one morning and you can cause them all to leave. <coughs> and then what do you do the next morning? There's this company, sit, there's this, there's this company uh, sitting there. Um, is the government supposed to decide who the new CFO should be? No, I don't think that's so. The, I don't so think the, that so is the, like, the it's a culture. It's the, a culture. No, it's a culture issue. We were, and culture happens at the top. So we were very aware that there were deep and profound cultural problems. We also were aware that this company needed to operate need and uh, needed uh, to function. I remember at the time, I used uh, the, the very unpleasant analogy that, and I don't mean that the analogy is strict in any way, but I think it does point up the problem of what the US occupation forces uh, experienced in both Germany and Japan. The original idea was that very large numbers of people who had been complicit in the war would no longer be able to have positions of power and influence in the society. And then they realized they sort of had to run the place. And their aspirations were very substantially scaled back. One thing you said is actually not, uh, is actually not quite far from right. Um, we did because when uh, Rick Wagner uh, left. There had to be a new. There had to be a new CEO, and the person who was sitting there to be the new CEO um, was uh, the number two at the company. He did indeed become the CEO. We did very aggressively move to recruit an outside chairman of the board, who took responsibility for overseeing management performance and overseeing a process of precisely culture change. We drew, we drew Ed Whitaker, someone from outside the industry, who within a relatively small number of months had made the decision that um, with the board that in fact the right thing was for him to become uh, the CEO and he then brought about very substantial change uh, in the management but it was done in a different way. So, you know, could we have done what he, could we have done, um, could we have done what would happen in uh, government or at uh, the Brookings Institution? Um, we, we, we thought about it. In government or in the Brookings Institution, you would say that the top person was gone. You would say that the act, that there was a new person who was, that the number two person was gonna be the acting person, that they were gonna be acting, and that there was going to be a search for a while to find a new person, and everybody would speculate about who the new person would be, and we would do a search, and the company would continue to try to operate. And we made the judgment, which was certainly the judgment that I think most experienced executives, and we consulted with a number at the time, felt was right, that to put the company in that kind of limbo and attempt to do a search at a moment when you were going through a bankruptcy would be to create so much uncertainty and so much lack of confidence that you would risk uh, destroying um, the company that, uh, you were trying, that you were trying to save. I guess as I look back right now, I think history sort of has to kind of come down on our side of that, in the sense that the company was successfully saved, I think it's very hard to argue that if more management change at GM had taken place in March or April, rather than in September, somehow we'd have a healthier kind of capitalism in the United States, and moral hazard would have been, would, would have been better contained. So I guess I think the judgments we made were broadly the appropriate ones.
Well, let's open it up because I'm sure a lot of people here have uh, uh, questions about this. And start right back there. And please identify yourself before you ask your question. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Rob Colorena, AIAC Investment. Um, you mentioned um, a debtor in possession um, of financing and, and some of the creditors' plans. Could you speak a little bit about, uh, Secretary, as to in ongoing plans, have you seen approaches by these institutions and bondholders to, to be more either liberal or or more conservative in terms of accepting these type of packages, sort of post, post your package? There are people who are uh, much more ongoing trackers of the restructuring market than I who could comment, uh, who, could, who could comment more much more intelligently than I. My sense of this is that uh, the combination of uh, the uniqueness of the moment, the uniqueness of the government role, the uniqueness of it being uh, the uh, major automobile companies means uh, that this is not heavily seen <coughs> as, a, uh, as a precedent uh, for, uh, future, uh, for future restructurings. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of my colleagues at the Harvard Law School who knows far more about bankruptcy than I ever will has been rather critical of the use of the 363 mechanism in this context. But even he says, if this became a substantial precedent, that would be problematic in terms of the expansion of the 363 mechanism. But it probably won't become a substantial precedent given the uniqueness of the circumstance. Other questions? Uh, way in the back. Mark, <clears throat> excuse me, Mark Gruenberg of Press Associates Union News. Um, you were right about the UAW, but I want to go back to one other thing and, and extend Mr. Murray's question. Uh, you said, quote, this is about GM, we were very aware there were deep and profound cultural problems, unquote, at the company that had to be changed in, in terms of changing top management and changing the attitude. The same statement, statement could be said about the banks. Uh, why? didn't that occur with the banks? Um, again, I think I, I think I tried to get at that, uh, uh, get at that question. Uh, in, in part, I, I feel I can avoid that question somewhat by saying that the most consequential decision of that kind was the decision made to universalize the support for the banks, which took place in 2000, 2008 when I wasn't in uh, government. But I think the rationale for that decision and the rationale at other moments was that you couldn't afford to do it uh, given the imperative of uh, preserving confidence and preserving the continuing functioning of the system. I mean, these things are always, these things are always a balance. It's just like I explained uh, with respect to why didn't, why weren't 20 GM executives uh, replaced? It wasn't a justice position that caused 20 GM uh, executives not to be replaced. It was a prudence in maintaining confidence and achieving the objective. And the judgment that was made by the people who were closest uh, to uh, the banking system was that it was uh, very, uh, very, very important to preserve confidence. And look, uh, when um, I've had the experience several times of buying a house, and it usually goes the same. It usually goes the same way. We're there, and we're there. And my wife says, "We need to get this house. It's really much better than the others. Why are you Why are you screwing around? Just p pay what you need to pay to get the house." And then we do, and we get the house. And having gotten the house, and once we've gotten the house, I say, you know, if you just let me uh, do my thing, we could have gotten the house cheaper. And maybe I'm right, and maybe I'm wrong. But from my wife's point of view, what was really important was that we buy the house. Well, what was really important was uh, that the whole financial system 
not implode. <laughs> could, could you have achieved more of what you're describing um, without um, making uh, the financial system uh, implode? I think that's, you know, that's something that, that's a counterfactual uh, that historians will debate. Would it have been great? Would it have been better in terms of uh, a variety of political uh, factors, in terms of a variety of confidence in elites uh, factors, in terms of moral hazard, if uh, more pain had been imposed while, um, while still preserving the basic confidence and functioning of the system? Yes. Was that possible? Very, very difficult uh, to make that judgment. Would a prudent decision maker be risk averse about destroying confidence? Yes, I think a prudent decision maker would be risk averse about uh, <laughs> destroying confidence. So I think it's a very difficult question to judge. Let me, before we let you off the stage, uh, let me get you to widen the aperture here a little bit uh, and talk about. I think it's gotten plenty wide already, actually. Uh, I'll get a little wider. We're going to talk about the industrial sector of the United States that, that, that the auto industry is, is, is just a part of and what's happening. We live at this extraordinary moment where there is a boom in energy, in natural gas particularly, which is not easily tradable, gives us a huge advantage to manufacturers in the U.S. Obviously, there's plenty of credit uh, 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 available. Uh, in the U.S. and the wage advantage that uh, that drove so much of the Chinese competition over the last few decades has narrowed considerably. So, so is there going to be a renaissance in American manufacturing? Look, yes or no? no. <laughs> um, there's going to be a blippy kind of renaissance. Um, there's going to be stronger performance than a simple extrapolation of trends would suggest for the reason you say. But there are deep realities here that are unaffected by any of what you mentioned. Look, uh, China has fewer people working in manufacturing today than it did in the early mid-90s. It is hard to conceive of anybody growing in competitiveness potential better than China has over the last 20 years. And they have fewer people in manufacturing than they did 20 years ago. That is a core fact. What is happening in manufacturing is what happened in agriculture. Fantastic increases in productivity coupled with relatively inelastic demand means that you need fewer people to produce all the manufactured goods that can be absorbed. That is happening globally. We are well along in that transition. Today, in the United States, less than 5% of the workforce are production workers in manufacturing. The standard statistic that's, that's quoted, which is more like 9 or 10 percent, um, is all workers in manufacturing, but that includes, the pe that includes Sergio's secretary, and that includes <laughs> the people who make his advertisements and the people who keep his books. So if you talk about what we think of as manufacturing, people in factories, that's already where agriculture was in 1940. That is already a small part of uh, where we are. So yes, we should do everything we can uh, to maximize our competitiveness in it. Yes, manufacturing is a crucial um, fulcrum uh, for uh, innovation. But the future of American employment is not in manufacturing is any more than the future of American employment in 1950 was uh, in agriculture. It gives me no pleasure uh, to, to say that, but I don't see how you can look at the facts on China, look at the extent of the productivity growth in manufacturing, look at the 
vast capacities for capital labor substitution associated with um, robots, associated with 3D uh, printing. Look at the globalization of supply chains and not see that manufacturing goods are becoming uh, cheaper. And, 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 and just, say, that, just, say one more, just say one more way. You know, it's true when you look across all goods, and it's, it's the most distressing fact about our economy, that real wages or median family incomes have been stagnant for more than a generation now. But if you look at how many hours of work it takes to buy a car, it's like half as many as it was a generation ago. Half, probably half as many as it was uh, in the 1970s. So real wages in terms of stuff like cars have come way down. That's productivity increase. That's the positive thing that has happened. But the other side of it is that since people don't want to buy twice as many cars because they're cheaper, that you need fewer people uh, to be working in the production of cars. So that's pessimistic about manufacturing, but not so pessimistic about the future of the middle class? Pessimistic about, you know, it's, you should, what, you know, has the last 50 years been good or bad for American agriculture? They've, if you, if you define what's happened by, in, in terms of American agriculture, in terms of the number of jobs in, in American Pessimism. agriculture, it hasn't been so great. If you say we can feed the world with far less national effort than it ever has taken in the history of man, you have to say that's an enormously positive thing. And something like that is, I think, the right way to think about it, manufacturing. It, is there a jobs issue here? Oh, yeah. The, yes. There's a huge, uh, there's a huge, I mean, it's once, if and when adequate demand is generated uh, in our economy, there is a huge uh, structural issue around uh, what is to be, what is, uh, going to be done by people who do not have the capacity um, to, be entrepreneur, to be entrepreneurs or write uh, software that is going to be a basis for uh, the kind of life and better lives for their children that people legitimately want. I mean, that, that's the economic question for the next 25 years. Larry, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.